Now, he's been described as the soldier soldier joining the army in 1969. Richard Dannett went on to rack up four decades of military service, with his career culminating in the role of head of the British Army. He's drawn on that experience for his book Boots on the Ground, which tells the story of the army since 1945, tracking key conflicts and examining the challenges it's faced in a changing world. He spoke to us from Edinburgh. In 1945, the British Army had 2.9 million soldiers. It now has less than 80,000. Is the story of the British Army during this period really the story of the management of decline? No, I wouldn't say it was the management of decline as such. I would say it was very much the management of change. And I say that because the title of my book is Britain and Her Army Since 1945. And it's a specific look at Britain our England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland together and how our country has changed from 1945 to 2016 when the book was published. And part of that process of change was an inevitable reduction in the size of the army, as you say, from 2.9 million at the end of the Second World War to just under 80,000 now. Um, we'll talk about the, the numbers in, in a minute, but I just wanted to ask you, first of all, about um, Iraq. You identified the Iraq invasion of 2003 as Britain's biggest military blunder. In fact, you've described it as an era of biblical proportions. How so? Well, I think you have to put it in the context of Afghanistan, and it's a really important point to make as far as that's concerned. After 9-11, quite properly, the Americans, led by, facilitated by the CIA, and with the British and other allies in support, went into Afghanistan, quite properly swept out al-Qaeda and swept away the Taliban who were hosting uh, al-Qaeda. And that was undoubtedly the right thing to do, because after all, it was from there that the 9-11 attacks were masterminded and many of the uh, people who were involved were trained, uh, and indeed trained for operations against the West throughout the world. Had we continued to invest in Afghanistan, then I think by 2005, 2006, when we, the British, led a big new operation in the south of Afghanistan, actually, alternatively, we could probably have been leaving that country, having stabilised it, done something for its economy, and given it a chance to find its proper place in the world. But instead, we took our eye off Afghanistan, we invested in Iraq. Yes, of course, we toppled Saddam Hussein pretty quickly. After all, we destroyed his army uh -huh. in 1990, 1991. But we had no plan for what should happen next in Iraq. Uh -huh. And then we had the descent into chaos that uh we saw after that. Uh, OK, um, you were a senior figure in the army at the time. Should you and your colleagues um, bear any of the responsibility about what happened? You say that, that there was no clear plan. Well, this indeed is correct. And I think actually history shows that uh, very clearly. Um, Military people certainly were involved and take, take some culpability in not having that plan. But I'm afraid uh, some events you can't control. Uh, in 2002, when the planning was going on, I was the assistant chief of the general staff. And at the time, the British Foreign Office was working with the US State Department in planning for what should happen next after Saddam Hussein had been toppled. But very shortly before the attack was launched in early 2003, uh, Don Rumsfeld, the US Defence Secretary, said that he and the Pentagon would take responsibility for what happened next. And they had a plan of sorts, which was that they would put some uh, new figures in to take over the levers of government in Iraq and point Iraq into a new direction to become a, a beacon of democracy and sort of Western values in the Middle East. And that did not happen. The Iraqi people took a hand in this. They destroyed their instruments of government. They destroyed their ministries. And there was no okay. plan B. So I'm afraid responsibility has to be shared by many people. But culpability goes quite a long way towards the Pentagon. OK. Um, let's talk about the funding of the British Army. Do you think the, the British Army is funded adequately for what politicians require of them? Because you have been critical of defence reviews and, and defence cuts. Well, the admirals, generals and air marshals who are responsible for the Navy, the Army and the Air Force will always want the best for their people. We will always want to make sure that we've got the best equipment that we can possibly have, usually at the cutting edge of technology, and that we've got enough people and that those people are properly trained to use the equipment that we've got so that we can respond to whatever challenge the world throws at us and whatever missions the government of the day gives to us. So inevitably, we're always going to be asking for more. Have we got enough? Well, we've been on a zigzag journey uh, over this over the last 10 years or so. Uh, I was very clear when I was Chief of the General Staff 2006 to 2009 that the Army, uh, 
which was doing the heavy lifting, the fighting and the dying in Iraq and Afghanistan at that time, was under, un underfunded, was under-equipped, and to an extent was undermanned. A lot of those problems were solved by 2008, 9, 10. But then, of course, in the wider context of the national economy, we had the collapse of the banking system, the period of mm -hmm. austerity that began in 2008, and the Chancellor, George Osborne, in 2010, demanded cuts in major, most of the major spending departments, and 7% was taken out of the defence budget, and then followed big cuts in uh, our defence capability. Uh, you, you mentioned there that you thought the army then was undermanned. The army nowadays does have a, a real problem with recruitment and retainment, um, not least in Scotland. Um, why are people not attracted to it as a career so much these days? Well, a number are still attracted, and it does remain a very attractive career. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot that appeal to young people about uh, service life in the army. But, uh, and this might sound rather ironic given what I was saying about Iraq and Afghanistan and the casualties and fatalities that we incurred. Young people do like an adventure. And it's been an historical fact that when there is a war or an operation of some sort going on and soldiers, sailors, airmen and the marines are on the front page of the newspapers and in the television headlines, that we always have a period of buoyant recruiting and high recruiting. And when there isn't such an operation going on, we always struggle to recruit. It's the same for both the regular forces uh, and the Army Reserve. So I'm afraid that's just a fact of life. Also set against the fact that the Army just five, six years ago was just over 100,000 and there was then cut by design to just over 80,000. So you get a feeling that the army is in decline, that the army is not recruiting, that maybe it's a shut up shop time and it disincentivizes people to join. But I would say to any young people or their parents who are watching this, it's still a great life and there will be many challenges to come. I don't know where, I don't know when, but adventures abound in the army, both today in a training sense, in an adventurous training sense, and there will be a challenging operation but, somewhere uh, in the future, I have no doubt. But the, you talk about the casualties in Iraq and Af Afghanistan, do you not think the bad publicity surrounding that has put people off, has had an impact? Um, to an extent, I think mostly it's put off governments. I think the government, both the Labour government up to 2010 and the coalition government and Conservative government more recently, were seriously scarred, and quite rightly so in many ways, by the 179 fatalities that we had in Iraq and over 450 fatalities that we had from Afghanistan. And the sight of coffins coming back through Royal Wooten Bassett was a very disturbing scene that was seen on television very regularly. And I think our politicians have said, oh, that constitutes very bad news from a political and government point of view. We must be very careful not to get involved in these kind of things again. And, and again, to an extent, that is right. Why I call my book Boots on the Ground is that most issues involving people are only settled on the ground. And the British government has to be very careful in future that it chooses to employ our military people in those operations when it's absolutely in our national interest to do so and not to do it on a discretionary basis because perhaps it would just be a good and helpful thing to do. There's a very important line to draw between what is non-discretionary and in our national interest and what would just be helpful in a worldwide sense. OK, we now have Donald Trump, of course, as the commander in chief in the United States. How much confidence do you have in him? Well, interestingly enough, I have more confidence over the last 24 hours than I probably have had over the seven months that he has been president. Remember, during the presidential campaign and early in his presidential days, he said NATO was obsolete and he was rubbishing that very important collective defence treaty organisation. But why I've been more encouraged in the last 24 hours was his decision announced a day ago that the Americans would not withdraw from Afghanistan, that they would probably send more troops in Afghanistan and they would continue to fight terrorism and to support the people of Afghanistan. And that is right. That is right for Afghanistan. He also spoke very bluntly about Pakistan and Pakistan needing not to interfere negatively in that region. And I think he also meant that he wanted to see America play a wider role in the fight against Islamist, jihadist terrorism and fundamentalism. And part of the fight against that is the fight in Afghanistan. So I'm more encouraged in the last 24 hours. And why I'm particularly encouraged is that although he's been sacking many of his advisers wholesale, left, right and centre, he's got a very strong foreign affairs and defence team. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, Defence Secretary Jim Mattis 
and National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster are all good people. I think they wrote the script that he spoke yesterday. He didn't deviate from the teleprompter. He did a good job to a good script that's been well formulated by sensible advisers, in uh, my view. You've charted the post-war world. Uh, how do you assess the global situation in 2017? I mean, how unstable is the world we live in today? Without becoming too gloomy about these things, I think so-called Islamic State, the situation in Korea, uh, and also the situation with regard to Mr. Putin are all areas of concern mm -hmm. at the present moment. And to my mind, the British government would be well advised to spend a little bit more on defence, a quarter or a half of 1% more, two, three, four billion pounds more. And funny enough, in the context of Brexit, when our European partners might be looking at us and thinking, oh, the UK is going to become isolationist. No, if we were to send a signal that we're going to spend more on defence in the context of NATO, I think it would send a very strong signal that the UK is a serious European partner. It's a serious player in European collective defence. We're a strong ally of the United States and we're going to stand our ground for Western values and British values. OK, Lord Richard Dannett and Edinburgh, thank you so much for joining us on thank Scotland you. tonight.